Okay, so then uh, let's get started. So it's it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Nilanjana Data, who is a reader at in quantum information theory um, with the, the Faculty of Mathematics at the University of Cambridge. And uh, so Nilanjana did uh, her PhD in mathematical physics, and uh, that's kind of one of of uh, I guess one of your topics been throughout. But you've also made many contributions to, to quantum information theory specifically, and uh, uh, even more specifically to, to finite uh, resource theory. So that's why, where we met um, first or when I was a PhD. I think my first conference was organized by you. So that, that was great pleasure. Um, so um, yes, so I don't want to um, spend too much time. I, you deserve a long introduction, but I think people are here to, to hear you speak, so so I give you the floor. And uh, if there are any questions during the talk, uh, ask them in chat, and uh, I will uh, forward them to Vilanjana at the end, or uh, unmute you so that you can ask them yourself. So with that, uh, I give you the, the floor. Thank you, Marco. Uh, hello, everyone, and many thanks to the organizers, especially Stephen and Minshu, for inviting me to give this talk. I'll be talking about perfect discrimination of unitary channels and novel quantum speed limits. This is work done with Simon Becker, who is in Cambridge, Ludovico Lamy, who's in Ulm, and Kambiz Ruse, who's in Munich. And this was our lockdown project. And it is on the archive, and this is the archive number, which I will post again at the end of the talk. So discriminating between unknown objects in a finite set is a fundamental task in any experimental science. So let us start by considering the task of discriminating between quantum states, the most basic objects that we encounter. So suppose you are given a quantum system A in an unknown quantum state rho, and you are told that the state is either rho one or rho two with equal probability. And so the set that I'm referring to here is a set of states row one and row two. And your task is to determine whether the state is row one or row two. So in order to do this, you perform a measurement. And so you do a two outcome measurement because you're trying to distinguish between two alternatives and you let the measurement be denoted by this curly M. And if the measurement outcome is one, you infer the state to be row one. And if it is two, you infer the state to be row two. Of course, you make an you can make an error in your discrimination. You can infer it to be row one when it is actually row two or vice versa. So the average probability of error in discrimination, if the measurement is M, is given by this expression, where um, these are, this is the probability that you infer it to be row one when it's actually row two, and this is the opposite. And these factors of half arise because you've been told that the states are row one or row two with equal probability. So the optimal error probability is obtained by optimizing or taking an infimum over all possible such measurements. And we denote it by this quantity, P error of row one and row two. So there's this beautiful theorem by Hollego and by Hellstrom, um, which gives an explicit expression for the optimal error probability in terms of the trace distance between the states. And just a reminder, this is the trace norm. So this takes a value between zero and two, the trace distance, and it takes a value two if and only if row one and row two are mutually orthogonal, which I denote by this symbol. So the, why are we focusing on the value two? Because when this takes a value two, the error probability vanishes. So what we see from here is that the optimal error probability in discriminating between the states vanishes if and only if the states are orthogonal to each other. And this is, of course, in accordance with what we learn from in quantum mechanics, that only mutually orthogonal states can be perfectly discriminated. What if you are now given, however, multiple, say, n identical copies of the unknown state? So now suppose you get rho tensor n, and you're told that it's either rho 1 tensor n or rho 2 tensor n with equal probability. Once again, we can get an expression of the optimal error probability using the hollywood hellstrom theorem. Now let me denote it by this symbol. So this P error with the superscript N just denotes the error probability in distinguishing between the two states 
when you are given n identical copies of it. So in other words, it is just equal to the error probability in distinguishing these n fold tensor powers of the state. And by Hollywood-Hellstrom theorem, this is its expression. But what we are interested in is how this scales with n. And there's this beautiful work by Nussbaum and Scola and by Audenat and co-authors, which establish that it actually decays exponentially in n. And this exponent is called the quantum Chernoff divergence or the quantum Chernoff bound. So let me carry this over to the next slide. So this quantum Chernoff divergence, its explicit expression is not um, important for the rest of the talk, but just want to point out that it takes values between zero and infinity, and it is zero when the two states are the same. So this is an interesting case when there's nothing to distinguish between. And it is infinite when the states are mutually orthogonal. But we are interested in this case when uh, the, it is, uh, the states are not mutually orthogonal, then it takes a finite positive value. So in this case, in the limit n going to infinity, this error probability obviously vanishes. So what do we note from here? That perfect discrimination of two states, row one and row two, which are not mutually orthogonal, is only possible in this asymptotic limit. And we'll keep this at the back of our mind. And move on now instead to discriminating between quantum processes, which is a general word that I use, but more specifically, we will focus on the task of discriminating between unitary quantum processes, which are modeled by unitary quantum channels. So these involve, of course, unitary operators and unitary super operators. So of course, uh, to an audience like you, I don't have to really motivate this, but in any way, unitary operators are very important because they are the building blocks of quantum computation. For example, in the quantum circuit model for quantum computation, the classical logic gates are replaced by quantum logic gates, and these are, of course, unitary operators. <clears throat> and a unitary channel is given by a super operator, which we denote by this curly U, and it acts on a state row of a system in the following manner, U row U dagger, where u is a unitary operator. So we shall consider the task of discriminating between a pair of unitary channels. So you are given a unitary channel u as a black box. And you are told that this black box is either a unitary channel u1 or a unitary channel u2 with equal probability. More specifically, let A be a quantum system and let HA denote the underlying Hilbert space and let D of HA denote the set of quantum states, so density operators, positive semi-definite and of unit trace. And U1 and U2, these channels that are introduced, they just act on the quantum system. So they map D of HA to D of HA. And let U1 be a channel which acts on a state row of the system by conjugating it with these unitary operators U1, U1, U1 dagger and U2 by U2, U2 dagger. So these are unitary operators. And as you can imagine, your task is to determine whether the black box is U1 or U2. Okay, so discriminating between U1 and U2 involves the following steps. Firstly, you have to prepare an input state or a probe state of the system A. Then you send it through this black box, which is either U1 or U2. As a result, you get an output state, which is either omega 1 or omega 2, where omega 1 is the state you get when the black box has the channel U1 and omega 2 when the channel is U2. Then at this point, the problem of dist distinguishing between the two channels reduces to that of discriminating between two states. So as before, you do a two outcome measurement to discriminate between omega one and omega two. And if the outcome is one, you infer the state is omega one, and hence the channel to be U one. And if it is two, then it is omega two, and you say that the channel is U two. However, this is not the most general protocol. More generally, you can prepare a bipartite entangled input state. So now one considers not just the system A, but one considers an auxiliary system or ancilla. 
and we denote that by a m prime and let the dimension of its underlying Hilbert space be m. So you prepare a bipartite state of the system and the ancilla, and this is what you do. So you send the system A through the black box, and the ancilla is left untouched. So in other words, acted on by the identity superoperator. Once again, you get an output state, which, but this is now a bipartite state. So it's one of the two states omega one or omega two, depending on the black box being the channel U one or U two. So omega one is obtained from the probe state if U one acts on the system A and omega two if U two acts on the system A. So now once more, you do a two outcome measurement to distinguish be between these two states, omega one and omega two. And as before, if you get one, you infer the state to be u1 and the channel to be uh, state to be omega1 and the channel to be u1 and similarly for the inference if the outcome is 2. Now now the optimal error probability for discriminating the channels is given by an expression of this sort. So if you forget the bit written in black that was exactly what Hollywood Hellstrom theorem told us was the optimal probability of discriminating between the states omega 1 and omega 2. But now we are wanting to discriminate between two channels. So we have these additional optimizations. One is the optimization of all possible input probe states. And this is the optimization of the dimensionality of this ancilla space. So I've just quite carried it over to this page, to this slide. Now let us remember that these were the states omega 1 and omega 2. So if you put them in the above line, you can write it compactly in the following manner. Okay, so I've just introduced the expressions for omega one and omega two. So this part, which I've underlined in this dashed black line, this actually is a measure of discrimination for channels. In our case, for the purpose of this talk, for these two unitary channels. And it is called the diamond norm distance. And we denote it by the symbol u1 minus u2 norm with a little diamond here. So let us just carry down its definition. So it is exactly the bit underlined, which I have rewritten here. However, one can prove that one can get rid of one optimization. Actually, one can restrict the ancilla space to be um, of the same, to be um, have a Hilbert space which is isomorphic to the Hilbert space of the system A. And further, one can restrict the supremum over pure states of the system and the ancilla, so which have denoted by the psi AA prime. So psi AA prime is a pure state density matrix, and the ket psi AA prime belongs to HA tensor HA primed, where the system and the ancilla uh, Hilbert spaces are isomorphic to each other. So if you put this in uh, the above expression, you see you get the error probability of discrimination between the channel is half, one minus half of the diamond norm distance. So that's what I've written in the next slide. Optimal error probability in discrimination is ex exactly as I said, error probability of u1, u2 is half, one minus half of this diamond norm distance. And I've also carried over the expression that we obtained for the diamond norm distance. Now, this diamond norm distance also takes values between zero and two, just as the trace distance does. And we are interested in the value two because the error probability is vanishes if and only if this diamond norm distance equal to two. And this is something we will use to the rest of the talk. So we always associate a value two of the diamond norm distance as vanishing error probability. So whenever the diamond norm distance is two, the channels U1 and U2 can be perfectly discriminated. Henceforth, we focus on discriminating between a pair of unitary channels acting on infinite dimensional quantum systems. So for example, a collection of electromagnetic modes traveling along an optical fiber. Now, each mode is modeled by a quantum harmonic oscillator. And such a system is called a continuous variable quantum system 
for which we use this acronym CV. And these arise naturally in quantum optics, for example. Now, the relevance of such systems is that they are candidates for many protocols of quantum communication and quantum computation. So let us recall a few basics of continuous variable quantum systems relevant for this talk. So we consider an M mode continuous variable quantum system. And so the underlying Hilbert space, which we denote by HM, is that of square integral functions on RM. That is denoted by AJ dagger and AJ, the usual creation and annihilation operators corresponding to the Jth mode. Here J takes the values one to M. And they, as you know, satisfy the canonical commutation relation given like this. Here I denotes the identity operator on the single mode space. And quantum states now, are trace class operators. So this is the space of trace class operators on HM. So they're positive semi-definite and of unit trace. And a Hamiltonian of such a CV system is a densely defined self-adjoint operator. And we assume its spectrum sigma H is bounded from below. And for convenience in this talk, we also consider the minimum of the spectrum to be zero. And such Hamiltonians are often referred to as grounded, but that's just a scaling of its ground state. Now experimentally, for a continuous variable quantum system A governed by a Hamiltonian H, there is a very fundamental limitation. One only has access to states with bounded mean energy. So you, only those states of the system for which trace rho A times this Hamiltonian is less than or equal to some E for some finite energy E. Now, this is a fundamental limitation because one cannot prepare infinite energy states in a laboratory. And this is therefore an energy constraint. And what about this Hamiltonian? Well, a natural Hamiltonian to consider for such systems is the number operator. And uh, it is given by this expression because as we said that every mode, and we are considering M modes, is modeled by a harmonic oscillator. Now, this energy constraint, however, leads to a modified measure of discrimination for channels acting on continuous variable quantum systems. And this modified measure is not just a diamond norm distance, but what's called the energy constrained diamond norm distance. So I can use the acronym ECD for energy constrained diamond norm distance. And this was introduced independently by Shirokov and Winter, and Pirandola also considered a variant of it. So how is this energy constrained diamond norm distance defined? So it's defined in the following manner. So let us, if you forget the bits written in red on the right hand side, then you, it is just the usual diamond norm distance that we had considered. But now, instead of taking a supremum over all pure states of the system and the ancilla, we take a supremum over those pure states such that the reduced state of the system A satisfies this energy constraint. And once again, the system and the ancilla have mm, isomorphic Hilbert spaces. So you see the quantity on the right depends on the Hamiltonian chosen and this energy threshold. And therefore we put the superscripts H and E and call this the energy constraint diamond norm distance. So it's useful for later on to just associate a figure to this operator whose one norm we are considering on the right hand side. See, it consists of this bipartite pure state psi A, A prime, and the A is acted on by this map U1 minus U2, and the A prime is left untouched. So this is the identity. And then as a result, we get this operator, and this is the one whose one norm distance appears in the expression for the diamond norm distance. And note that even though this is a pure state, the input to, uh, on this leg is in general a mixed state because it's the reduced state of this pure state. Now, if you take this energy constrained diamond norm distance and take a supremum over all energy values, then of course, you recover the normal diamond norm distance. And there are, these satisfy beautiful properties, but we will not go through that in this talk. 
What we shall do is instead study discrimination of pairs of unitary channels acting on continuous variable quantum systems. Now let me start by stating our results, actually some of our results. So the first result, let me say, state the first result in words and then as a theorem. So in words it reads as follows, no entanglement is needed to discriminate between two unitary channels acting on a continuous variable quantum system. So even though we saw in the previous slide that the most general protocol involves an entangled probe state. So let me state the theorem. The theorem, it goes as follows. Let U and V be two unitary channels acting on a continuous variable quantum system A, such that for all states of the system A, U acts on rho in the following manner, U rho U dagger and V as V rho V dagger, U and V are unitary operators. And let H be a Hamiltonian of the system, some self-adjoint operator as we discussed before. Then the energy constrained diamond norm distance for some energy, finite energy, is given by this expression. Okay, we'll go over this expression again and again and interpret it. So let me carry it over to the next slide. So all I've done is copied that expression over. Before going into details, let me ask this question. How does this above expression for the energy constrained diamond norm tell us that an entangled probe state is not needed for the discrimination task. Why do I ask this question? Because that was my informal statement of the result. Okay, how can we see that entanglement is not needed? In order to do that, let us start with the left hand side. <clears throat> the left hand side was just the energy constrained diamond norm distance, which was defined in this manner. Here, rho is just rho sub a, that of the system, the reduced state. And we had associated this figure with this operator whose one norm appears in the definition of the diamond norm distance. And what I pointed out is that though this involves uh, a supremum over these bipartite states, which are pure, what goes in here is the mixed state because it's in general a mixed state because it is the reduced state of psi a, a prime on the system A. Okay, but look at equation one. Look at the right hand side of one. What appears on the right hand side of one is only the ket psi A. Yeah, and, and this implies that the associated density matrix of A is rho A is a pure state density matrix. Now, so how can that happen? So that can only happen if this psi A A prime, which is the ket, corresponding to this psi a prime appearing in this expression is itself of this product form between a ket of the system A and that of the system A prime, which is the ancilla. So the fact that you get this expression for the energy constrained diamond norm distance implies that this supremum in two can be restricted to unentangled states. So that's how you know that entanglement was not ultimately necessary in obtaining this energy constrained diamond norm distance between two unitary channels. So hence theorem one tells us that an entangled probe state is not needed for the discrimination task for a pair of unitary channels. And this is a nice result because it greatly simplifies the experimentalist task because he or she would no longer need to prepare an entangled probe state for discrimination. I'd like to say that this theorem that I just stated generalizes a seminal result by Aharno, Kitaev, and Nissan to the infinite dimensional setting. So way back in 1998, they proved that entanglement is not needed in the discrimination of two unitary channels in the finite dimensional setting. Let's move on to our next result, theorem two. It states that in the setting of theorem one, there exists, there always exists a positive finite integer n such that n parallel users of u and v can be perfectly discriminated using inputs of finite energy. So what does that mean? That means that there always exists some n 
finite n such that u tends to n and v tends to n has a diamond norm distance, energy constrained diamond norm distances too. And remember, this just is another expression of the mathematical expression of the fact that u tends to n and v tends to n can be uh, perfectly discriminated. So just a few things, what is H sub n here? It is just the n copy Hamiltonian. It is given by this sum where each Aj is a tensor product of n elements with H appearing on the jth location. Okay, so this is the theorem, but let's look at its important implication. Theorem two implies that even if U and V are two channels, such that a single copy of them cannot be perfectly discriminated. That is, in other words, the energy constrained diamond norm distance of U and V is not equal to two. Then there always exists some N finite and some energy, finite energy, such that the N fold copy of them can be perfectly discriminated. And this is very interesting. Now, why is this very interesting? Because this is in contrast to what we saw was the case in state discrimination. In state discrimination, we saw that if you had two states, row one and row two, which are distinct and not mutually orthogonal, then we saw that row one tends to n and row two tends to n can be perfectly discriminated only in the asymptotic limit n going to infinity. But what we see for unitary channels, there is a finite n for which they can be perfectly discriminated. I like to state that our theorem two is actually an extension of a celebrated result by Tony Asim in 2001. He proved the same result for unitary channels acting on finite dimensional systems. I'd also uh, point to the paper by Duan, Feng and Ng, where they proved a similar result, but using a so-called adaptive strategy, which I'll come to at the end of the talk. Okay, the most familiar unitary channel that you can think of are those arising from the time evolution of a closed quantum system evolving under the action of a Hamiltonian. So let H and H prime be Hamiltonians governing the evolution of two such quantum systems, A and A prime, with isomorphic Hilbert spaces. So what am I trying to do? I had to give you a result for arbitrary unitary channels acting on continuous variable quantum systems. And now we are wanting to focus on a most familiar class within them. So consider these two time evolution channels. So these are unitary channels. Let me denote them by ut rho and vt rho. So uh, they depend on the parameter t, which is time. And so this is just the time evolution channel generated by the Hamiltonian h. Rho is some quantum system and uh, vt rho, which is generated by h prime, yeah? And these two quantum systems have isomorphic Hilbert spaces. <clears throat> so our third result quantifies the relative drift caused by these two different unitary dynamics generated by h and h prime, respectively. So uh, what is it? So if h and h prime are two Hamiltonians, such that their difference is in some sense small compared to H. Our result holds in that scenario. So mathematically speaking, we have that H minus H prime is what's called relatively H bounded. That just means the following inequality holds for all states psi, and here alpha and beta are positive constants. So if this condition holds, then for all T positive and finite energies, we can find an explicit upper bound on this energy constrained diamond norm. And it's interesting to find how it depends on T. And we find that it depends on the square root of not just T, but the product of the energy and T. Well, this result is not just simply that of purely mathematical interest, because it has an important, it leads to an important corollary, which can be interpreted as a rather novel type of quantum speed limit. So just to remind you, quantum speed limits in the literature are bounds on the minimum time needed for a given initial state of a quantum system 
to evolve to a prescribed final state or a class of final states. For example, the very first quantum speed limit was studied by Mandelstam and Tam, and they found that the time, minimum time needed for a system in some pure state psi initial to evolve to a state psi final, which is orthogonal to it, takes a time t, <coughs> uh, which is lower bounded by pi divided by twice the energy variance in this initial state. Now, there have been a lot of work on, on quantum speed limits where the initial state is both pure and mixed and the quantum system is open or closed. But the quantum speed limit that we get from our theorem pertains to a rather different scenario. It corresponds to two different <coughs> quantum systems or more precisely two different unitary dynamics. <coughs> so this is the novel type of quantum speed limit. It provides a bound on the minimum time needed for the two different dynamics corresponding to the two different Hamiltonians, H and H prime, which I introduced in my last result, to evolve a given state psi for which this energy constraint is satisfied to a pair of states, phi t and phi t primed, such that these evolved states are a fixed distance d apart. So we, remember, the, uh, so what we get is a lower bound on the minimum time needed to achieve this. And we find an explicit expression for it in terms of this fixed distance, the energy threshold, and the alphas and betas, which were the constants appearing in this original condition of relative boundedness. So let me give you explicitly, the corollary says the following. For a state psi in particular, whose expectation in whose, um, for which the expectation value of the Hamiltonian is equal to this chosen energy E, the minimum time needed for the states phi t and phi t primed obtained by evolution of the original psi under the Hamiltonians H and H prime to be some D, satisfies a bound given like this, where alpha and beta are the constants appearing here. Well, um, our next result is actually an extension of this theorem to quantify the relative drift, cause not, not just between two time evolution channels, but rather between the unitary dynamics ut of a closed quantum system governed by some Hamiltonian, and the dynamics of an open quantum system, which is governed by what's called a quantum dynamical semigroup, for which I use this acronym. So this is a one parameter family of quantum channels. So for every time t, lambda t denotes a quantum channel, and lambda t plus s is the composition of lambda t and lambda s. So this is the so-called semigroup property. And in the limit t going to zero, lambda t rho, which is the evolved state at the time t, starting from rho, minus rho, its trace distance is equal to zero. This property is called strong continuity. Now, of course, you cannot really compare the evolution of a closed quantum system with any arbitrary open quantum system. So what exactly is the scenario? The scenario is the following. You have a closed quantum system A governed by some Hamiltonian H, and this is the unitary channel corresponding to its time evolution. Now you consider this system A to be in contact with some environment, some bark, say, with which it has unavoidable interactions. So now the system A is no longer closed, it's an open quantum system, and its evolution is governed by a quantum dynamical semigroup. And each lambda t can be formally written as e to the tl, where l is the generator of the dynamics. And let's focus on the difficult case where L is an unbounded generator. Now, what do we assume? We assume that L is of the well-known GKLS type form, which is after Gorini, Kosakowski, Lindlad, and Sudarshan, which says that for any X in acting on an operator acting on the system A, L acts on S in the following manner. So here, this is the dissipative part, and the first is the familiar Hamiltonian part. 
These are called Lindblad operators. Now, what is interesting and what is what I'm trying to point out is that you're not just considering a closed system with any open system, but you are uh, considering the relative drift of the dynamics of the open closed system with that of an open system whose Hamiltonian part is the same as that of the closed system. And the result that we get is that once again, if the dissipative part is in some sense small compared to the Hamiltonian part, so that it satisfies such a relation for some constants alpha and beta, and for all state psi, then for all times and all energies, once again, we bound the energy constraint diamond norm distance now between the unitary channel and the channel lambda t corresponding to the open system dynamics. And once again, we find such a behavior in um, a square root t dependence. But in addition, there's now a linear term. And this too, again, uh, leads to a corollary, which is a quantum speed limit, which gives the bound of the minimum time needed so that rho of the system, when it evolves under the closed system dynamics and evolves under the open system dynamics, they are a distance d apart. And we can explicitly determine a lower bound on that minimum time needed as a function of E, D, alpha, and beta. Okay, let me give you the sketch of the proof of at least one of, my result, of our results. So let's start with the proof for theorem two using the statement of theorem one. Okay, so I hope up to here the statements were clear. These were the quantum speed limits. So let me remind you what theorem two was. Theorem two read as follows. U and V, let's write it in the simple form. Are, say there are two unitary channels. So such that the energy constrained diamond norm distance is not equal to two. That is, they cannot be perfectly discriminated at a single copy level. Then the theorem two said that there always exists a finite N and some finite energy such that their N fold tensor powers can be discriminated perfectly. That is their energy constrained diamond norm distance is equal to two. So let's try to prove this. Now, before proving it, let's ask, and the reason I want to prove this is the proof is very pictorial. But before proving it, let us ask a simple question. Under what condition can two arbitrary unitary channels, U and V, acting on a continuous variable quantum system, be perfectly discriminated? So we recall this was the optimal error probability of distinguishing between U and V. It was given by this expression, energy constrained diamond norm distance. Therefore, the, this error probability vanishes. In other words, perfect discrimination is possible if and only if this diamond energy constrained diamond norm distance is equal to two. So the question I'm asking can be cryptically written as follows, that the diamond norm distance equal to two if and only if what, right? What is the necessary and sufficient condition under which this energy constrained diamond norm distance is equal to two? Can we find a useful uh, representation of it? So to do that, we make use of theorem one. Theorem one gave us an expression for this energy constrained diamond norm distance, right? It was this expression. So of course, this means that this energy constrained diamond norm distance would be equal to two if and only if this second part in the square root is equal to zero. Okay, so let's stare at it for a while. So see, what can we do? We can just, uh, to make life simpler, let's call u dagger v to be some operator w. Here u was the unitary operator corresponding to the channel curly u and v the unitary operator corresponding to the channel curly v. So if we let this be w, then the fact that this is equal to zero leads us straight away to define this set of complex numbers. So what is this? These are just the expectation of w, right? For, and, uh, uh, for those size which satisfy this energy constraint. So let us look at this set of complex numbers. I hope, I'm sure some of you can recognize this set. This is, in other words, called the new restricted numerical range of this operator W, the restriction being this energy constraint. So once we divide it, we define this set because it immediately gives us the required necessary and sufficient condition. 
It tells us that the energy constraint diamond norm distance is equal to two if and only if the origin of the complex plane belongs to this set. So this con as long as these are complex numbers, so if zero belongs to the set, because then this will become zero and the energy constraint diamond norm distance will be equal to two. So we'll keep this in mind. So this is true for the uh, energy constraint diamond norm distance for any arbitrary u and v. So I've just written it here. This is equal to two if and only if zero belongs to the set SEW, where this is the set SEW. Okay. All right. So, however, it can be shown if we denote that sigma omega W is the spectrum of W, where W is this operator, then it can be shown that the interior of the convex hull of the spectrum of W is contained in the union over E of these sets SEW, which in turn also is contained in the convex hull of the spectrum of W. So let's focus on this bit. So you see, if this zero belongs to the interior of the convex hull of the spectrum of W, so if the origin belongs to the interior of the convex hull of the spectrum, then this origin, these are both the same O, the origin also belongs to the set SEW for some E positive, which in turn would imply that the energy constraint diamond norm distance is equal to two. So what am I trying to say? That if we want the energy, con if we want to perfectly distinguish between two channels U and V, we want the energy constraint diamond norm distance to be equal to two. And then a sufficient condition for that is that the origin of the uh, complex plane, that is O, belongs to the interior of the convex hull of this operator V, because then this O would also belong to the SEW for some E positive because of this inclusion. And that we saw was a necessary and sufficient condition for this to be equal to two. Okay, so now we are just through a series of quick figures, I can give you the theorem two. This was what we wanted to say that there always exists a finite N such that the N fold copies can be perfectly discriminated. Now, in order to prove this, we want to prove that the origin belongs to the interior of the convex hull of the spectrum of now we are considering the n fold tensor power. So not of W, but of W tensor n. So what am I going to show through a series of three figures? Let us see how, even though zero does not belong to the interior of the convex hull of W, because a single copies of U and V cannot be dis discriminated, there always exists an N such that the origin does belong to the interior of the convex hull of the n-fold tensor power. So that U tensor N and V tensor N have an energy constrained diamond norm distance of two and can be perfectly discriminated. So the key idea is just this. So W is a unitary operator. So its spectrum is on the unit circle in the complex plane. And we consider U and V to be different in general because we want to distinguish between two different channels. So W is in general, not an identity, not identity. So what do we have here? The, so the spectrum lies along this arc. So Z and W, by Z and W, I denote its endpoints. And theta is the angular spread, which is defined in this manner. Sorry, this is to be a minus. <clears throat> okay. So what is the question we ask? As we saw, does this origin belong to the interior of the convex hull of the spectrum of W? Let's see this in this little example, what we get. If the answer is yes, then U and V would be perfectly discriminatable. So this is the interior of the convex hull and we see the origin does not belong to it. So we see, right, we cannot distinguish between a single copy of U and V. So let's move on. Let's move on to two copies of U and V. So now we consider the spectrum of W tensor W. Now its spectrum is, has endpoints Z squared and W squared. It lies along this arc. And we ask the same question. Does the origin belong to the interior of its convex sum? Let's draw it. 
No, it still doesn't belong to it. So we know that we still can't distinguish between two copies of U and B. Let's do the same for a threefold tensor powers of the two channels. So now the quantity of interest is the spectrum of W tensor W tensor W. What is its spectrum? Its spectrum lies along this arc with endpoints Z cubed and W cubed. And let's ask the same question. Does the origin belong to the interior of its convex hull? Let's draw it. Yes, it does. And so the origin does belong to the interior of the convex hull, and there we go. We have found that even though U and V could not be perfectly discriminated, U tensor three and threefold tensor power of U and V can be perfectly discriminated. So more precisely, we show that uh, for n given by this expression, floor of pi over theta, where theta was the angular spread of the eigenvalues, the origin does belong to the interior of the convex hull of W tensor n for such an n. This in turn implies that the origin belongs to the set that we had defined for some e, where this was the set, this was the restricted numerical range, but now with psi belonging to the n-fold uh, tensor power of the Hilbert space of HA. And this in turn was the origin belonging here for some E was the necessary and sufficient condition for this energy constrained diamond norm distance to be equal to two for that E. And hence, we know that U tensor then and V tensor then can be perfectly discriminated for this finite end. So this leads me to my summary. So in this talk, we studied dis the discrimination between two unitary channels U and V acting on a continuous variable quantum system. For example, modes of an electromagnetic field traveling through an optical fiber. The measure of discrimination used was that of the energy constrained diamond norm distance. Our first result was that the entanglement is not needed for this discrimination task. And secondly, we proved that there always exists some finite n such that u tensor n and v tensor n can be perfectly discriminated. And this is in contrast to the case of discrimination between channels, which is only possible for in the asymptotic limit if the, uh, sorry, the case of states, because in the case of states, as we said, there can be two states which are not mutually orthogonal can only be discriminated perfectly in the asymptotic limit. So this is in contrast to it. And then we uh, obtained a series of results which led to novel quantum speed limits obtained by considering either unitary channels UT, VT generated by two different Hamiltonians or also by comparing the time evolution of a closed quantum system with that of an open quantum system, the same Hamiltonian part. So governed by UT, which is a time uh, evolution channel, and lambda T is a quantum dynamical semigroup with the same Hamiltonian part. Now, since we are distinguishing between U tensor n and V tensor n, this is the so-called parallel strategy, because you're using these channels in uh, n-fold channels in parallel. But an open question is, is it possible to obtain the same result by means of an adaptive strategy? Because this is known to be possible in the finite dimensional energy unconstrained scenario. And this was the work done by Duan, Feng, and Ying. Thank you very much. And thanks to my co-authors, Simon, Ludovico, and Kambis. This is the archive post. And all relevant citations are included therein. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nina Jana. Um, so your talk was so clear that there weren't any questions during the talk. But maybe um, now there's some people want to come forward with questions. So to start with, I have one uh, question. Mm -hmm. So to me, that, that kind of energy constrained diamond norm makes a lot of sense uh, physically, obviously. Um, but one thing I'm, I'm a bit confused about. So when you, um, when you add uh, this additional system, yeah. 
right? This this um, auxiliary system. There is no energy constraint on that. It appears right. It's only on the marginal of the the system. Okay, I'm very happy you asked this question <laughs> because I know the answer to it. Uh, there, so as I said, the energy, energy constraint diamond norm distance was originally considered independently by Shirokov and by Winter, but a variant of it was studied by Pirandola. And actually what Pirandola studied is exactly what you are referring to. So he considered an energy constraint both on the system and the ancilla, so on the composite part. But what one can prove is that the energy constraint diamond norm of Pirandola with this joint constraint, energy constraint, is equivalent to the energy constraint diamond norm distance considered by Shirokov and Winter, which I considered. So in other words, if I had a, um, if I could, I would have written straight away, but can I, no, I can't possibly write. So what, maybe, can you give me one, uh, one moment? Maybe I can even write it here just to tell you, uh, let's be adventurous. I've never done this, but so one can actually prove this, that if you have this energy constraint diamond norm of Pirandola, yeah? Which, where the energy constraint is both on the system and the um, and, and the ancilla, then it is less than equal for some energy, say E, yeah, and this is less than equal to so the energy constraint diamond norm distance for that E for Shirokov and Winter, and which is uh, less than equal to the energy constraint diamond norm distance again of Pirandola, but with two E. So you see, the two norms are equivalent one can prove. That's why here it is more convenient to stick to this other norm. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. That that explains it very well. Um, so do you see there is a Q and A button somewhere on your Zoom? Okay. And, and with that, you should be able to directly see the question. So there's one by Sattvik. See? Uh, okay, let me... Uh, where will I go? Q, Q and A, yeah. Do you see? Do you see the question? Okay, a couple of technical questions. How does one take the domain issues that might arise due to the unboundedness of the Hamiltonians under consideration for in the energy constraint relation trace rho h or in the definition of the yes, of course. But this is a, a talk, right? Uh, so if you look at a paper, you will see that the, all these domain issues have been carefully taken into account. Yeah. So of course you have uh, um, to consider. Um, the um, row in the domain of H. So these technicalities, it's a completely mathematically sound paper and all these technicalities have been taken into account there. Satvik. Right, so uh, am I audible? Yes. yes, you are. Yeah, so I mean, uh, yeah, so that was just uh, like the technicalities, but for example, in the relative edge boundedness, it might happen that, for example, the two Hamiltonians, their domain is not even like the intersection is empty. So I mean, there must be some constraint on what kind of Hamiltonians might come into the definition of the relative bound relative boundedness yeah, so in the yeah. first place. Yeah, is, yeah. is there so some restriction? No, no. So there, there are, uh, so, uh, they are, um, so you have to consider uh, H and H and H prime, those pairs of H and H prime, which satisfy the relative boundedness condition and therefore uh, for which um, the right hand side is, you know, is finite. So everything has to be well defined, but you have a whole class of physical examples, for example, arising from quantum Brownian motion, uh, and uh, uh, quantum Boltzmann equation. So there are lots of examples for which you can choose an H, given an H, you can choose an H prime so that there is no problem in the definitions and uh, in the bounded, relative boundedness conditions and in domain issues. So if you look at a paper, you will see yeah. this series of interesting physical examples. So it's not just, what I'm trying to em emphasize, it's not just a precise mathematical, it's not just a ma for mathematical convenience that we define that. There are uh, classes of physically relevant examples where um, this condition is applicable. All right, yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, are there any further questions? The 
There seems to be something which has come up again, but I don't know whether it's a different question or the same question. I think it's still the same. So, okay. But I mean, if any questions come up, uh, please feel free to send me an email because uh, I'll be happy to address your answer. And if anybody has an idea of doing kind of this important open question that I flashed here, it's not easy. And uh, uh, and there, well, let me uh, also state that uh, one thing we've been thinking about, so this is a, something to do with unitary channels. What if we consider the very slight next extension? What happens for isometric channels? Because you see, um, you know, they are so similar to unitary channels. But what we find is that we get a counter example. So this proof, this proof that I showed you, which is uh, really based on um, the spectrum of lying on the unit, unit circle. It is uh, really a feature of this, these unitary channels. Uh, sorry, for which statement you get a counterexample? If instead of U and V being unitary, if we consider U and V being isometries. Or oh, for the statement that entanglement is not needed or the... No, no, no. I'm talking about uh, the fact that for a, uh, in finite n, you can always discriminate. So, oh, okay. so that, yeah, for that bit. Yeah. Okay, well, um, okay, now, it, now there's a question um, in the chat. Can we obtain the results restricting Gaussian channels and using only Gaussian states with bounded energy? By Ho Yong Kim. Uh, uh yes um i guess the answer would be yes there uh, so yeah i mean uh, the answer to that question yeah is a, it is a generic question which we always ask whenever we deal with gaussian channels right restrict to gaussian states um uh, we haven't worked that out in detail, but yes, my answer would, to that question would be yes, I, I would expect it to uh, hold. But if you are interested in uh, the paper, there is another result, um, because you mentioned the word Gaussian, which is to do with the Gaussian, which I'm not going to now at all, because I've not covered anything to do with it. But if you're interested, look at it, because we have a Gaussian version of the solovic kitaev theorem which stems from these results. Thanks. There seems to be another chat question, Marco. Can you please read it out? Something came up just now. Um, no, that's still the same one, I think. Okay, sorry, I'm not yeah. used to it. Okay. It's just said thanks. Okay. So, <laughs> so if there are no other questions, I think, um, um, we are running well in time, but so, so if there's uh, still time for one more question, but otherwise. Um... Yeah, I'm happy I managed to finish on time. Yes, so, so otherwise, I'm, uh, let's uh, thank Neil and John again for those who uh, can show their appreci appreciation with a uh, <laughs> thumbs up or something. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Yes. Thank you, Nina. Yeah. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Must have been a long day for all of you. Good night. Yeah. And <laughs> Good morning. Have, have a nice day. <laughs> bye then. Bye. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Bye. So this concludes today's program, and uh, we will continue tomorrow. See you guys. Bye.